Good morning. Oh, thank you. More, more, more. No, no, I'm kidding. Stop, stop. That's enough. Um, so who went to the party last night? Hands up. Yes, well done. Respect. Invest in every one of those because they've got the stamina to make it through the day. Okay. So to, firstly, I'm blown away by the content and quality that we've had over the last couple of days. I shouldn't be surprised because the organizers care about this kind of stuff, but it, it really is. The, I do quite a few of these. This is the best. This is the one I always have to say want to, want, want to be at. And today is no exception. Today, most of the day is going to be dedicated to social purpose of blockchain, how, how this stuff makes the world better. But to start off with, uh, we also have the, a very important custodian section. This is a huge problem to solve, right? There is no DTCC for crypto yet. So every institution I meet wants to know, how do we solve that problem? We're going to hear from some great speakers here today about that. But we're going to kick off today with somebody I had the privilege of sitting next to at dinner, Dr. Rand Hindi. We had a terrific conversation, some of which I'd love to tell you, but I'd probably be arrested. No, no, it's, it, was, I wonder, it was terrific. But um, he is the co-founder of SNPs, which is about voice AI, but he doesn't really want to talk about that so much today because he wants to tell us a little bit more about how blockchain can help us protect privacy in AI. Now, he loves computer and data science. MIT loves him, uh, electing him one of the TR35 under 30 rock stars. He's got degrees flowing from every part of his body, including masters and things like UCL Singularity and Think Understand. Please put your hands together for Dr. Rand Hindi. Great. So. Um just to give you a little bit of context, and thank you for the introduction. I mean, I've been in tech since I was a kid, started coding when I was 10, my first company when I was 14, did my PhD in machine learning at 21. But for the past 10 years, I've been particularly interested in exploring this intersection of artificial intelligence and privacy. This is a very, very important topic. And this talk is really more about privacy in general, and I'm just using blockchain as an example of how you can achieve that in AI. But of course, you know, this goes way beyond that. So, you know, how many people here actively care about privacy? Like, I'm by as in, like, do something to protect it, right? So, if you're okay, let's do a small experiment before we get into the talk. Take out your smartphone, right? Everybody, just pick up your phone, smartphone. It only works if everybody does it, including you. <laughs> now, unlock your phone and open your last conversation. Like, anyone, it doesn't matter. Like, I'll open WhatsApp, for example, or Signal if you use it. Now. Everybody has a conversation open. Now I want you to give your phone with this conversation open to your neighbor. All right. Now, if you guys care about privacy. Exactly. So you know what you just did? You just clicked one of those I accept button effectively. But in this case, you're giving your neighbor who's right next to you access to your data. Try to imagine what really happens when you give a company access to your data and you have no idea who's going to see it on the other side. That's like giving your phone unlocked with all your private conversations to potentially hundreds of thousands of people, to governments, to hackers. And once you get hacked, it's done. You're never going to retrieve that piece of privacy back. And so the way I look at privacy is not about trying to hide something. Because most of us probably you know, are having pretty decent lives. We don't necessarily have things to hide. It's really just about preventing companies and preventing governments from having a very accurate picture of us. So think about it this way. Every time you create data, every time a company has data about you, they're really just creating a more and more accurate profile. So think of it like a puzzle. You've got, in the beginning, no idea what you're looking at in the puzzle because the image is like incomplete. But the more pieces you're adding to the puzzle, the clearer it actually becomes. And this is what happens with your personal data. The more data you're giving to a company, the more that company has an accurate profile of who you are. And this profile is very, very dangerous because it can be used for manipulation, right? We've seen this with Facebook, Cambridge Analytica. I guess everybody's familiar with that, right? So what happened here is, Facebook built such an accurate profile by just flying in those puzzle pieces of your social life that another company ended up using your profile to start manipulating you. 
And so for me, privacy is not a question of hiding yourself. Privacy is a question of not giving away too much about who you are to prevent being manipulated in return by people who might not have the same motives as you do. So fundamentally, protecting privacy is about protecting your freedom. And this is what you have to keep in mind. Whenever someone says they don't care about privacy, ask them whether or not they care about being manipulated on a daily basis. And you'll see what they say about that. And so, you know, think about what people have done with this Facebook data. And now try to imagine what's happening today with those voice assistants. Who's familiar with this object? Okay. Well, my goal as an entrepreneur is to destroy that. All right? Yeah, because this is literally a wiretap inside your home. If people could manipulate you with your social data, what do you think they can do with the data in your home? Right? And Amazon claims that they only actually record what you say after the word Alexa, but the way that these things work is not 100% sureproof. So about once or twice an hour, it will mistrigger and record a random piece of conversation. And by the way, every time you're installing an application on Alexa, Amazon gets all the data coming from this app. Every single voice query you're making to any company who's building on top of this platform, Amazon knows about it. So Amazon now has one in six Americans talking to their devices. And by the way, it's also the company that gives the least amount of information on how to collaborate with the government. So to me, that represents 20 years of the wrong mindset around personal data. The reason why these companies are doing it this way is because they're monetizing your data. That's their business. And back in the 90s, monetizing personal data was okay because it wasn't that much of a big deal. There was not much personal data floating around. But the more you start digitizing everything around you, the more you started putting those connected devices in your life, in your home, the more data you're producing. And so today, the impact of a breach on your privacy is absolutely huge. And my conviction is that we're now got to a turning point where if as a company you're ignoring people's privacy, you will never be able to compete long-term. Apple, Google, Amazon, they might be able to live with it because they're huge established brands. If you're a new competitor entering in the field, there is no way your answer to data privacy can be, I don't care, right? Make sense? So do not buy this. So however, no, but we do want to use it, right? Because it's actually a pretty cool product and it's actually very useful. So what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to give you an example of how using some modern techniques, we're able to offer the same product Amazon does, but without any impact whatsoever on privacy. The first thing you need to keep in mind is when you're talking to this thing, this is a computer, right? So inside the Amazon Echo, there is actually a chipset. There is an Android operating system. So why are we sending our voice to the cloud in a server 3,000 miles away when we're actually talking to a computer in front of us? Why doesn't the computer analyze your voice directly? So this is something that's called edge computing. So cloud computing is about sending the data to the cloud for processing, then sending a response back. Edge computing, on the other hand, is about processing your data directly on the device that created the data. So in this case here, you could directly have your voice analyzed by the object without ever sending it to anybody on the internet. And so think about what that means. It means that you could have technically the same product without anybody accessing your data or your kids' data if you have kids at home. And despite what big companies are trying to make you believe, you don't need a lot of computing power to do that. Having an equivalent of Alexa takes the equivalent of a Raspberry Pi computer. A Raspberry Pi is a $10 kid's computer. You don't need the cloud to actually analyze people's voices, right? You just need a $10 computer. So whenever a company tells you they need the cloud to analyze your voice and your data, what they're really saying is, I want your data. That's the real thing behind it. And by the way, when you compare the performance of the cloud-based voice assistant and the one based on the edge, it turns out it's exactly the same. So you're not even making a trade-off of performance to do that. You're getting the exact same product and value without any compromise on privacy. But however, sometimes people will tell you, well, you know, AI is about combining data from multiple people, right? That's kind of like the power of big data and things like that. And so why would we care about privacy if at the end of the day we're still sending our data for those companies to improve the quality of their products? And so this is one use, interesting and useful use case for a new type of technology that combines decentralized machine learning, blockchain, and traditional cryptography. It turns out that today we have the technology to teach an AI 
based on people's encrypted data without anybody actually seeing their real data. So it sounds like black magic. You're literally creating something out of you know, noise, but it works really well. And the way it works is fairly simple. I'm a user. I've got my own AI on my own device. I speak to it, and whenever I speak to it, I'm making an update to my own AI on my own device. Now, the question is, how can I share this update with all the other people's updates so that we could benefit from each other's data? Make sense? That's the whole goal of AI. So what I do here is I'm going to encrypt my data, and I'm going to send it to the developer who needs the data. So I'm never sending the actual data. I'm sending encrypted data. And the way I encrypted it, I just added a random number to it, effectively. Now, the developer ends up being able to add up all of the encrypted updates of every single person and ends up with one huge update, but then it's encrypted with the keys of everybody who sent data. And to decrypt it, what you end up doing is each user will send the key that they used to encrypt the data to random computers on a blockchain. They will put them together and send back this huge, massive combination of keys to the developer. So the developer never has the keys of each individual, but ends up only with one master key that can only decrypt the combination of the encrypted data of everyone. And those computers on the blockchain don't have the actual data. They only receive the keys. And so this enables you effectively to train what we call a neural network, which is an artificial intelligence model, without ever compromising privacy. This is cryptographically guaranteed to be secure as long as at least half of those devices in a blockchain are not colluding with the developer. But if a developer can corrupt 50% of the devices in a blockchain, he's probably have other things to do than you know, just hack on your own data. And so this is important because you know, here the blockchain is not just used to perform this computation and guarantee that people actually do the computation. It's also used as a reward mechanism. So it's not just about protecting privacy. You're also giving back to users some money out of their encrypted data. So this approach, which is something we call privacy by design, is absolutely fundamental. Most companies who are trying to offer privacy today will tell you, send me your data. I promise I'm going to delete it, and I'm going to store it securely. That's not privacy by design. This is something we call privacy by trust. You're effectively trusting a company with your privacy. That's what Apple does, for example. When you use Siri, Apple pretends that Siri has privacy because they delete the data, but you're still sending the data to Apple before they delete it. So what happens on the side of Apple, you have no idea, right? You're completely trusting them to do whatever they're claiming they're doing. And so that's privacy by trust. And my belief is that privacy by trust is equivalent to no privacy whatsoever because you don't have transparency, you don't have guarantees, you don't have control. Privacy by design, on the other hand, means that you've mathematically made it impossible for a company to abuse your privacy. However much I would like to access your data, in what I just showed you, I cannot. Because I'm either getting encrypted data, and if I can break this kind of encryption, frankly, I can make money in many other ways, right? Or I'm doing things on device. So I'm guaranteeing you, in the design of the product, that nobody will ever access your data and privacy is guaranteed. Which, you know, by the way, is exactly what's being promoted in Europe with a GDPR. Are you guys familiar with this regulation? That's amazing, because for the first time, people and companies have no choice but to start thinking about privacy by design. The first time I started talking about privacy by design a few years ago, people were like, oh, that's great, super intellectual conversations, always interesting, but you know, go play with the other people, we're gonna do business. Well, today you have no choice. If you wanna access Europe, as an American company, you need to comply with privacy laws. And look at what happened to Facebook, right? Facebook, after the massive scandal of Cambridge Analytica, everybody thought, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, Facebook didn't really lose much users. There wasn't much of an impact. Well, it turned out that in a day, they lost 20% of their market cap, $100 billion lost because of that scandal, basically. This is the biggest drop in terms of dollar market capitalization in the history of the American stock market because of privacy. So if you still think that privacy is a secondary thing to consider when you're building something today, think again, right? And so the reason why I'm talking about this is because for me, blockchain, cryptography in general, artificial intelligence, you know, it's really not meant to produce a future that looks like this, right? This is, this is what I've been told the future looks like when I was a kid. Extremely totalitarian, extremely policed, 
like advertising in your face, manipulating you, go eat McDonald's, you know what I mean? But really, when you talk to people, who wants to live there? One time someone said me, but you know, <laughs> he was a bit weird. Uh, so no, nobody wants to live there, right? What was your favorite time during the summer? Holidays, right? I mean, I don't know. Maybe if you went on holiday. No. When you ask people, when you actually ask them, you know, what is like the desirable future you want to live in, pretty much everybody says that. People don't want more technology. They don't want to be manipulated. They don't want to have this kind of like angst that you felt when I asked you to unlock your phone, right? And the more you have to think about your data and your privacy, the less you can feel safe about using technology. And the more this technology is going to keep appearing in your face as a problem, as a friction point in your life, and not as what it's supposed to be, a liberating thing. So for me, privacy, blockchain, artificial intelligence, these are technologies that we have to start combining together to try and get rid of all of the problems that are currently making us stress in our daily lives. And perhaps if we get to that point, then we might actually all feel happy like we do when we're on holidays. Thank you.